Hello everyone. I am Dr. Midun Mohan, faculty in emergency medicine from Government Medical College, Kori Code. And along with my team, I would like to demonstrate how to manage the airway of a critically ill COVID patient. Now, rapid sequence intubation. It can be divided into seven P's of RSI as we call it. It includes preparation, pre-oxygenation, pre-medication, paralysis with induction, positioning, placement of tube, and post-intubation management. Let's go through each of these steps in detail. Preparation in this case has to be done outside the airborne infection isolation room. This includes donning your PPEs and body check, drugs and equipment preparation. Drugs include pre-medication drugs, induction drugs, paralytic drugs and post-intubation sedation and analgesia drugs. Draw them into syringes and mark the syringes. Discuss the roles and responsibilities, the condition of the patient and your backup plans for a difficult airway. Now let's see how it's done. Hi, I am Dr. Kavita, emergency physician. Please, please introduce yourself. I am Dr. Arshad Fazal, I am also an emergency physician. I am Dr. Abil, I am also an emergency physician. Oh, so in our team, Dr. Arshad is the most senior person among us, so he will be the intubator. Okay. Um, and Dr. Abil, you can be the airway assistant sure, and I will be the team leader. As well as I will be dealing with the drug side, I will monitor the patient also. Okay. Uh, so let's move on to our buddy check. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Dr. Akhil, will you please adjust your... Oh, sorry, doctor. Is it alright? Yeah, now it's alright. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, we have a patient, 35-year-old male patient. He's a COVID-positive patient with ARDS. And uh, as of now, his hemodynamic status is stable. But okay. Uh, he needs airway assistance as well as he needs ICU care. Okay. okay. So, for that, we have to check. Uh, let's move to check our intubation rule. Can yeah, we move yeah, sure. So we have a modified bag and mask device with viral filters, catheter mount and peep valve attached to it. And we can initially plan for a video laryngoscopy assisted intubation if we fail. Uh, we can uh, go for second generation uh, supraglottic airway device with an eye gel. Or uh, if we come across a situation of can't intubate, can't ventilation situation, we can go for a front of neck access. And all the necessary drugs are being drawn and loaded in the syringe. So, okay, doctors, uh, are there any concerns? No, we are ready. No. Okay, so we are good to go, okay? Yeah, sure. Once you enter the room, assess the situation and touch as little as possible to avoid formites. The intubator should be at the head end, the airway assistant to his right, and the team leader who also administers the medications as well as monitors to the left. A quick assessment of the airway may be done to look for possible difficult airway. Identify the cricothyroid membrane as well. Ensure two functional intravenous access. Next step is pre-oxygenation. For this, first turn off the oxygen. Remove the NRBM mask as well as the face mask by cutting them off. And disposing them properly. Apply a nasal cannula initially. And set a flow of 6 liters per minute. This can provide apneic oxygenation as well as apneic CPAP. Use a back mask ventilation device with a viral filter and a flexible catheter mount to provide leverage and a peep valve if available between the mask and the back. Use a firm two-handed VE grip to prevent any leak. A non-vented NIV mask of optimum size may be used to achieve a better seal. Now keep the flow of at least 15 liter per minute. 
the adequacy of the flow may be assessed by looking at the reservoir back. It should not collapse during inspiration. Avoid bagging as far as possible. A low pressure bagging technique may be used at 6 to 10 breaths per minute if the patient has poor respiratory effort. If the patient is agitated due to hypoxia, pre-oxygenation may be done after giving 0.5 to 1 mg per kilogram of ketamine or 0.01 to 0.03 mg per kilogram of midazolam, depending on the hemodynamic status of the patient. Patient may be positioned in a rammed up position to facilitate pre-oxygenation as well as intubation if desired. Pre-oxygenation in this way should be continued for 3 to 5 minutes depending on the condition of the patient. Next step is paralysis with induction. Induction of unconsciousness and complete paralysis before laryngoscopy is highly recommended to prevent coughing by the patient and inadvertent exposure of the healthcare provider. This also facilitates first pass success of tracheal intubation. Ketamine 1 to 2 mg per kg or atomidate 0.15 to 0.3 mg per kilogram are the preferred induction agents. Consider giving a lower dose if the patient is having borderline or unstable hemodynamics. Have a vasopressor like push dose epinephrine 0.1 to 0.5 mg ready to manage post intubation hypotension if it develops. Succinylcholine 1.5 mg to 2 mg per kg or rocuronium 1.5 mg per kg are the preferred paralytic agents. Wait for at least 45 seconds to 1 minute for the paralytic agents to take effect before attempting intubation. Sedation only intubation or awake fibroptic intubation should be avoided. Patient may be positioned in the sniffing position after induction and neuromuscular blockade. If available, an aerosol box may be kept over the patient to prevent further aerosol dispersal. Turn off the oxygen before removing the back mask device. This helps to reduce aerosolization. A video laryngoscope assisted intubation is preferable to conventional laryngoscopy to reduce the risk of exposure. Intubate with a 6.5 to 7.5 mm internal diameter ET tube in females and 7.5 to 8.5 mm internal diameter ET tube in males. Cover the adapter of the tube using a ghost pad to prevent splashing of secretions while removing the stillet or the bucci. Do not check the position of the tube without inflating the pilot balloon with 10 ml of air and attaching a viral filter to the ET tube adapter. If a standalone mechanical ventilator or transport ventilator is immediately available, connect the ET tube with the viral filter attached to it to the ventilator and avoid using a manual restator or ambu bag. A closed suction should be pre-connected to the ventilator circuit if available. Continuous waveform capnography if available is recommended to confirm tracheal tube position initially. Bedside ultrasound may also be used for the same. The physician should then exclude bronchial intubation by 5-point auscultation or a chest x-ray. Carefully remove the aerosol box after this. The ET tube should be fixed at about 20-21 cm length in females and about 23 cm length in males. Now the final step of rapid sequence intubation is post-intubation sedation and analgesia, which is very important. If endotracheal intubation by an experienced intubator fails after achieving adequate patient relaxation and proper positioning, 
then ventilate the patient after inserting an appropriate size supraglottic airway device like a laryngeal mask airway or an eye gel device if available. Now if you face a can't intubate can't oxygenation something we called as CICO situation proceed with emergency front of neck access. It can be done with procedures like surgical cricothyrotomy. One of the team members or a person with full PPE who waits outside the room should have the expertise for e fauna if this situation arises. Communicate clearly. Simple instructions, closed loop communication, adequate volume without shouting is essential. Place a nasogastric tube after tracheal intubation is completed and ventilation established safely. If COVID-19 status has not been already confirmed, then take a deep tracheal aspirate for virology using a closed suction. Closed suction if available is preferred for clearing the tracheal tube compared to open suctioning. Discard disposable equipment safely after use. Decontaminate reusable equipments fully and according to manufacturer's instructions. After leaving the room, ensure doffing of PP is meticulous and coached by a teammate. Clean the room 60 minutes after tracheal intubation or last aerosol generating procedure. Airway management is a skill and any skill can be learned only through practice. So we urge you to practice whatever we demonstrate here before venturing into the risky procedure of airway management of a critically ill COVID patient. Now the most important part coming to the principles of intubation in COVID patient. First and foremost is healthcare provider safety. How to ensure this? We can divide them into steps. First of all, steps to reduce contamination. Limit the number of people in the room to three. One intubator, one airway assistant, and one person for pushing the drugs and monitoring the vitals. Full PPEs, which includes N95 respirator, goggles, face shield, coveralls with hoods, or isolation gowns and cap. Shoe covers and double gloving is a must for all. Ensure that donning has been done correctly by yourself or better if checked by your teammate. Use video laryngoscopy if available to limit the proximity to the patient's mouth. Unlike direct laryngoscopy where you need to look inside the patient's mouth. Once you're done with the procedure, Place all the soiled equipments in double sealed biohazard bags so that no one will get further exposed to them. Proper doffing procedure with hand hygiene is a very crucial step and it's always better to have someone coach you through the steps. The next most important step is to reduce the exposure time with the patient. For this, preparation is the most important thing. A dedicated intubation team with members who have been trained together using simulation exercises for this is highly desirable. A clear plan should be made and discussed. This includes the roles and responsibilities of the team members, the condition of the patient and the backup plans if you encounter a difficult airway. Have a COVID-19 trickle intubation trolley that can be used in the emergency department ICU or elsewhere prepared. Use a checklist to make sure that all the necessary equipments are available and functional before entering the room. Try to get the intubation done in the first try itself. Repeated attempts increases the exposure time as well as may harm the patient. So it's highly recommended that the most experienced and skilled intubator should attempt the procedure. Giving a muscle relaxant during your rapid sequence intubation facilitates first pass success. Next most important step is to minimize aerosol generation and its dispersion. Early intubation is preferred instead of non-invasive ventilation or high flow nasal oxygen. 
If you have to use them, make appropriate modifications. Intubate in a negative pressure room if available. Alternatives we have mentioned in the previous lecture. Rapid sequence intubation with a higher dose of paralytic agent is the method of choice. This ensures apnea because even the air that the patient exhales is contaminated with viral droplets. It prevents cuff while laryngoscopy and intubation. And finally, it relaxes all your airway muscles, including the vocal cords, which makes the procedure easier. Post-pressure ventilation, high flow oxygen, and manual bagging should be done only if clinically necessary. Always use viral filters when doing these procedures. Inflate the tube cuff before post-pressure ventilation. Limit ventilator disconnections. Now to summarize, healthcare provider safety is the first priority. Do not rush in without proper preparation even if the patient is really sick. Prepare to do CPR as well. Take precautions to reduce aerosolization at every step. RSI with complete paralysis is the method of choice for intubation. COVID specific simulation based learning as teams can help to prepare better and reduce errors. Thank you.